I got a last minute invitation from local Captain John Galvin aboard the Mulberry Canyon to join him and good friend John Pilcher on an offshore trip to the canyons. I jumped at the opportunity and headed to Falmouth Harbor for a late morning departure. We pushed off the dock after prepping for the long steam and headed to Hydrographer Canyon to target the marlin, swordfish, and tuna that swim in the blue water 120 miles off the New England coast. We steamed past Martha's Vineyard, passed over the shipping lanes, and into the vast expanses of the Atlantic Ocean. Basically on the very edge of the continent of North America, um, that's why you have this real significant drop in depths where it goes from about 400 feet to well over 2,000 feet in a very short distance. And uh, basically this is the edge of the continent. We go a little bit further and uh, we're out in the middle of nowhere. There's just miles and miles and miles of open water out here. It can be tough to kind of find a starting point. Um, so we have John talk a little bit about what we're looking for specifically when you get out this far, you make all this investment to get this far offshore. What are the things that you're looking for when you're looking for a place to start setting up to fish? Uh, begins, you know, having your temp chart. Mm -hmm. Gives you an idea where to start. Your structure, unlike inshore, it's not your traditional structure being a wreck or a rock pile. You will get tide rips out here, but your, your main structure is more your sea temperature. On the colder side of the top of the canyon, we're about 69, 69 yeah, so and a half. Five, six degree temperature. And now first. we're a couple miles down the canyon, and we are in 74 and a half degree water. You can see on the chart plotter here, if I zoom out, you can see how the, all the contour lines kind of converge. It's very similar to if you took an aerial shot of the Grand Canyon and then flooded it with anywhere from several hundred feet to several thousand feet of water. And as we zoom in, you can see where these depths really converge tightly together with the continental shelf. And that brings um, up the nutrients from the ocean floor to the sea surface and kind of starts the whole food chain. Correct. You get the, you're going to get the plankton and the small crustaceans, the small fish. Uh, that's You might find many weed lines where that upwelling occurs at a temperature break. Gotcha. And that way then you can fish a weed line, then you get a surface structure that you can work along where you're going to find fish. Uh, many times your high flyer lobster pots yeah. are going to be in the general vicinity of a temperature break. Gotcha. And uh, again, that's more more man-made structure. Yeah, I and mean, we just saw our first couple sets of high flyers here, and uh, those are always a good sign. They attract light. It's always a good place to aim for. Mm -hmm. And where there's small life, there's bigger life. Yeah. Yeah. And we're at the top of it all here, so hopefully <laughs> uh, we get to we get to catch something big and throw it in the box. So our basic spread on Mulberry Canyon is pretty simple. Eight rod spread utilizing 680s, 170, and 150 with a second 50 set up as a pitch rod in case a white marlin comes into the spread. We also employ two teasers, one off each rigger. Uh, one is a large marlin type lure that's hookless and the other is a mole crab squid chain. Uh, and they're operated via teaser reels affixed to the hard top. Lots of bait, we run a lot of ballyhoo, about 85, 90% of our spread consists of meat, uh, some daisy chains, uh, green machine spreader bar. We will fish some plastic sometimes. I just find it's hard to beat the real thing. Uh, the valley who are mixed between horse size and medium size. So you can see we have the uh, hook nicely buried in the bottom. There's not much exposed there. The small leg sinker underneath the chin that's going to help keep the bait digging into the water. A uh, small chugger skirt in front of it, that's just going to add some splash, make it dance around. Pretty simple presentation, but very effective. Whoop, oh, there's a hit. I told you. Yeah, you called it. <laughs> Get a belt on. He's off. Yeah, we'll fish him tonight. He's doing his best to get free, but I don't think he's gonna make it. That's good. We get some life on the high flyers. Yeah. It's always a good sign. All right, got a nice, uh, very lit up mahi here. It's a smaller specimen, but we'll take it. It's hanging on one of those high flyers. Uh, we've only been out here for about 10 minutes, so it's a good sign. 
get the skunk off the boat, get the sky on ice, and get this line back out there. We just had a couple knockdowns around some high flyers here on the west wall of the canyon. Whenever you get a knockdown, it's good to, uh, good to double back. Um, and there's always, could be other fish holding on the high flyer that you didn't, weren't able to pull off of it on your first pass. There we go. That's a better fish. There should be more coming. Well, there we go. We got another one. We just went by another high flyer. Just the second or third one we passed here. We just doubled up. All right, so we're on the uh, we're on the kind of mid mid afternoon troll here. Uh, you know, things things can go kind of slow sometimes. We've gotten a few mahi so far, but. Right now what we're doing is kind of trolling along the shelf, looking for basically any sign of any kind of life we can see. Uh, even a few birds can tip you off to a uh, potential bite. Um, school of porpoises would be ideal. Uh, there's often yellowfin, albacore uh, hold underneath them. Uh, school of skipjacks, a lot of water to be covered. We're headed towards, uh, towards Welker Canyon. Uh, we're gonna hope for a swordfish bite later. We'll see what happens. But, um, promising. It's a full moon uh, tonight, and uh, that's prime time, so let's see what happens. It's been pretty quiet. Um, we just had some marks, saw a couple of porpoises, a couple of birds. We get some life in the water. Water temperature's up to 76 degrees, uh, which is typically marlin weather. Had something just hit in the spread. Not sure what it is, but these guys seem to think it could be a marlin, which would be fabulous. There he is. There he is. We saw him. Yeah, we got something in there. Definitely something playing with the spread. These guys are doing a good job dropping lines back. Marlin are notorious for coming up into the spread, slashing around, picking and choosing, going from one bait to another. Seems like it, it always is helpful to be able to speed up or drop back a bait, catch your interest. And I just saw something I couldn't make out exactly what it was, but it came in and boiled as he was dropping that back right in the, the middle of the spread. Good chance he's still out there somewhere looking around. It does appear that we uh, could potentially have a marlin in our spread here. So, oh, there it is, there it is. He's picking and shoes and slapping away. Our fingers crossed. He's got a fish on, fish on. There he is, there he is. Now ah, we're fishing. He's up on top. Looks like it's probably a white marlin. He's flailing around there. We're gonna keep him away from the boat here while we can clear these other lines. But uh, he's probably gonna put on a little bit of a show here. Uh, the blue marlin get a lot bigger. The whites tend to be under 100 pounds. But anytime you get to dance with a billfish, it's a good day. It's a good day. Well, that guy was uh, in our spread for easily three or four minutes, maybe more. He was coming up slapping at different baits. He went from the spreader bar back to the ballyhoo, back to the spreader bar. There he is up on top. Forward. Go ahead. I'm going forward. You now when I get the leader, yep, back walk it up. straight back Stay to the steps, rod, yep. and then give me some drag. Okay. Back off the drag. Yep. yep. He's right there. Nice whitey. That's awesome, absolutely unbelievable. Beautiful fish. Nice white marlin. This guy's in the pocket. Oh, right there. Working in uh, 76 degree water. 
Everything worked out as planned. We got a marlin in the boat. We're gonna release this guy. Uh, general rule of thumb with these billfish is you know, keep him in the boat as short of a time as possible, get him back in the water, but he came in pretty quick. Wasn't that long of a fight. We got him on real heavy gear, so he should be in really good shape. Absolutely beautiful fish. This is why we came out here. Not, everybody comes out 100 miles offshore. You're looking for something different, and this is it. Beautiful white marlin. Textbook hookup on him. Get this guy back in the water as fast as we can here. Get him revived and let him go. All right, let's get him back in the water, boys. Yep, keep him vertical. Hold his dorsal fin up. Then we try to release all billfish. Try to make sure they go back in a really good, healthy condition. Nice late day marlin. Many times the marlin are much more of a middle of the day, high noon type fish. But... Seems like we're seeing better numbers of them out here the past few years. So mm -hmm. Let's hope that continues and uh, we'll see more and more of those guys and trips to come. Okay, we had this fish uh, out of the water for just a couple minutes, but that could be enough uh, time to do some harm to it. So we're gonna really take our time reviving them. We've got them dragging them against uh, nice along Mikey. the side of the boat making sure he gets some oxygen back. As soon as he gets his colors back and start to see some tail movement, he'll be ready to go. She's good. John, that was pretty incredible. The guys in the cockpit did a knockout job baiting that thing, teasing it in. Um, that's my first personal white marlin. I've been tormented by those things several times and uh, nice. I've failed to connect with them. So that's pretty exciting for me. Uh, great for the, the audience at home to be able to see such a magnificent fish. Uh, as well as being able to see it swim off after a nice fight like that. Yep, they're beautiful back. fish. They're uh, they're very tricky to hook. They're probably the most persnickety of all billfish. Yeah, I think that fish had five different lures before it kind of finally found one. It was well. The That's Whitey's for you. They'll they'll torment you, as, as you've stated, for a very long time. So far, we're off to a pretty good start here. We got a white marlin, a couple of mahi. Uh, when we come back, we're going to keep up on the troll switch things up for the night fight, and hopefully things will get a lot more interesting as the trip goes on. All right, we've got a nice, beautiful sunset on this side of the boat. Over here, we've got a big, beautiful full moon coming up. As the sun goes lower, all the bait will kind of ascend in the water column, come up towards the surface. We're already starting to mark a lot of bait down about three, 400 feet. We'll keep on the troll at least into the darkness and hopefully pick up a couple of tuna. Get, uh, the mates here are doing a great job cutting up some sardines. We're going to use these uh, later on tonight after we start trolling. We'll set up drift, do some chumming and chunking, and uh, hopefully pick up some tuna that way and also have a good possibility of picking up a swordfish. There's some marks. Oh yeah, those are fish, all right. All at once, one. One time, one shot. That's it. As the sun descended below the horizon, we stayed on the troll with hopes of hooking the tuna, while the crew readied the bait and gear for a night of sword fishing. All right, well, this is a uh, low legal squid that we caught in the Vineyard Sound this spring. Uh, they're available like uh, right around May 1st until third, fourth week of May. Uh, they make great swordfish baits, much better than the frozen jobs you can buy. Um, we're using a, a uh, Lingren Pittman commercial swordfish hook, a glow bead in the top to stop it from coming through, and then we floss the hook onto the squid as well as floss the head onto the mantle just so it doesn't get ripped off when the swordfish wax it. So we'll see how it works later. We're still trolling right now and hoping for one more tuna bite. Fish on. Past couple hours, we found an area with a lot of bait in it. Saw some birds, a couple of porpoises around here. So we've been kind of pounding it out in the same area. Another one. Another one. Doubled up. Okay, uh, we're still here on the on the beginning of the night troll. Sun's been down for about uh, half an hour now. Pretty inactive, but we found some good piles of bait. Promising looking water, so uh, Captain decided to stick it out and uh, paid off. It's got doubled up. Got a little yellow fin. It's probably the same thing on the other line there. Where's the gaff? I'll do. I'll gaff him if you want. Right here. Showing no mercy whatsoever on this fish. I'm gonna be right behind you. A little bit better. 
this, throw them in the box. It often pays off. A lot of people think that you know trolling is just a daytime thing out here, but a lot of times it, it really pays off to keep going into the dark. And uh, there's guys that'll even troll throughout the night. Got doubled up, got both fish in the boat. So we're gonna keep on going, get the lines back in the water, try to pick up a couple more tuna. Shoots, he scores. Yeah, today it's a, it's a full moon, so we're going a little bit shallower because the fish will probably, and the bait will probably tend to come up to the moon. All right, we have about uh, four or five flats, a nice big sardines here. We're gonna get a chum slick out, which I know some people aren't always a fan of when they're sword fishing, but there's also tuna, there's big eye, all sorts of other stuff. Um, sharks are pretty much considered a nuisance. Um, if you chum too heavily, you increase the odds of bringing in a lot of sharks, and you're just gonna mess up your gear and waste your time, so. So John, what's the plan for tonight? We're gonna set out three rods for the sword baits. Is that what you're fixing to do here? Yeah, we're starting out with three, because we usually, we generally run four, but we're, since we're gonna be chunking, mm -hmm. um, we really don't want leave us some space so we yeah, can do leave some, some other space. stuff. We're going to get the swordfish baits away away from the boat, probably yeah. 100 yards or so. What I've done is I've tied a floss loop with rigging floss onto this 300-pound wind-on leader, and that allows us to take the light, connect it, and we always know that it's in the right place, marked on the line. It prevents it from sliding down the line. Eight to ten feet away from there, we have a two-pound bank sinker. We've got this. Uh, swimming noodle with a zip tie on the top and this allows the when we let the line out it'll stand straight up and we just let it go drift out with the current until it gets almost out of sight when a fish takes the bait oftentimes they swim straight up and the weight is lifted off of this float and it'll lay over on the side and that often signals a bite that you would miss if you weren't watching it all right, we've uh, been out here for quite a while now. I have no comprehension of even what time it is, but it's going to be well past midnight. It's been a pretty uneventful night. I had a couple mahi around the boat, a lot of jellyfish, but uh, John Pilcher here just came tight on something. It's on one of the sore lines. It doesn't appear to be very big, whatever it is, but it is alive. Well, and it's, it's, holding the, it's holding the uh, float down. Yeah. So it may be bigger than you think. I don't know. We had three lines set out here for swords with the uh, light sticks on them. This was on the shortest one closest to the boat. We've also been chumming a little bit. We've had a steady chum slick going all night and uh, appears we have found some sort of life form here out in the canyons. But uh, John just noticed a slight little bump in the drag as we were drifting along here and he went to check on it. As he tightened up, put pressure on the line, we saw the, the float with the glow stick go underwater. So that's a sign that there's something on the other end here. What it is, nobody knows. Really take your time. We get you know, some heavy tackle on this fish. Get everything right, it's not going anywhere. No need to rush. Oh, you can't oh. Off. He's off. He's off. The agony of defeat. Damn it. Well, we're still in the game here. We still got a couple hours of darkness. We're gonna get this guy set back up. We still have two lines still in the water, so uh, we're still fishing here. All right, welcome back. It's day two in the canyons. Right now we're at No Name Canyon. We made a little move. Uh, we had a long night, but the sun's back up. We've got the spread back in the water. And we're out here today on the Mulberry Canyon. It's a beautiful boat, 40-foot Cabo. We have Captain John Galvin at the helm. He's an experienced offshore fisherman, knows these waters really well. We also have uh, John Pilcher, contributing writer for On the Water, is with us. We've got a great crew, We've got the lines in the water, and uh, hopefully the fish cooperate. Right short, right long. He's off. All right, we just uh, came by at another high flyer. We're still early in the troll on the second day. Uh, had a couple of hits right in this one spot. Not sure if there's small mahi, maybe small tuna. 
Uh, three or four rods get tagged, but nothing, uh, nothing, no solid hookups. So we're gonna uh, make an etch a sketch on the chalk water and pound these these waters a little bit, see if we can't get something to rise up to the spread. Today on Mulberry Canyon, we're employing a pretty basic eight-line spread, um, consisting of a mix of both ballyhoo and some artificial presentations. Some days the fish want more meat, some days they want artificial. That's why we pull a mixed offering to figure out what they're hungry for. Looks like we got a high flyer. Go find another mahi, maybe Oahu. Oh, fish on, fish on! Get a belt on. A little bit decent fish. This one feels a little bit better than the way it's going. So uh, one of the biggest things you don't want to do is horse them in too quickly. You want to be able to clear the lines and the closest side to, to make room for the fish to come in. This guy's got some weight to him. Pretty a decent yellow fin. guys on the smaller side, we didn't put the gap on him, we're trying to get some footage, so I think we're going to let this guy go, is that the verdict? Yeah. He's earned his freedom. Beautiful fish, we'll let that guy get bigger, he'll get three, four, five times that size if he makes it. It's good karma. Boom! Doubled up, baby! Doubled up! These fish seem a little yep. nicer. It's gone deep. Back down drag off. John's still tight on his fish. Another yellow, couple of yellow fin tuna. Uh, we had three knockdowns. Landed one so far. If we can get the second one in, we'll be doing all right. Go two for three on these guys. So there you have it. Another great trip offshore fishing in the canyons. Top-notch crew. These guys worked their butts off all day. Kept all the lines clear. Absolutely incredible crew on this boat. I'd like to thank Mike and Scotty. Um, absolutely incredible trip. If you've never been offshore fishing to the canyons in the Northeast, you gotta get out here. Anything can happen, all kinds of different fish. We just released a couple of small yellowfin to live another day. We got plenty of fish in the box. We got four mahi, we got about eight or nine yellowfin. Uh, we got to catch a white marlin. We got to play with the swordfish for a while at night. Absolutely incredible trip. I'd like to thank Captain John Galvin of Melbury Canyon Charters Great boat, great operation, great crew. It's one of the pinnacles of fishing in the Northeast. With another successful canyon trip in the books, we headed for home. We fished nonstop for 20 hours and loved every minute of it. To learn more about offshore fishing in the Northeast, pick up a copy of On the Water magazine or log on to onthewater.com.